Whether you realize it or not, DC voltage references are a very important part of a large majority of electronics projects. A DC voltage reference is basically a device that, ideally, gives you an exact DC voltage regardless of input voltage. It should also ideally be immune to noise from all sources. In other words, it's really just a device that gives you an ideal exact voltage under any sort of circumstances. You might be wondering why we would need something like this in the first place. Well, take, for instance, the most obvious use of a DC voltage reference, which is its use in digital voltmeters. A digital voltmeter, at its most basic, is simply just a device that uses an ADC, an analog to digital converter, to convert whatever voltage we need measured into some known digital value. However, to allow the ADC to get to a digital value, we need to compare the measured voltage against the known voltage. This is where the voltage reference comes in. By being very stable, we can guarantee that the ADC has a reliable source to compare the measurement to, which will allow us to get an accurate result. If we used a bad voltage reference, which drifted around a bunch, and it wasn't accurate, then that inaccuracy would creep into our measured results. Basically, the voltmeter can only be as accurate and precise as this voltage reference allows. That's perhaps the most straightforward use case of a voltage reference. Anytime you use an ADC, you use a voltage reference. The same is also said with DACs, which are digital to analog converters, since you need to specify what the output voltage should be in relation to the voltage reference. There are other applications for voltage references, such as comparison voltages, bias points, use in control systems, and so on. But enough with what you might find a voltage reference in. Let me show you a few different references in order of least accurate and stable to most accurate and stable. In cases where you don't really need any stability or accuracy, you can kind of get away with using a voltage divider. The obvious issue here is that any noise or change in the supply voltage will appear directly on the output of the divider. Not to mention that you really can't load it at all without using a buffer. I've used something like this in cases where you need a rough comparison voltage and the supply rail is reasonably stable for what you're trying to use it for. Anyways, going forward, we are going to try to produce voltage references that at least make an attempt to filter out some of the supply rail interference. I'd say the simplest proper voltage reference is just a diode with a current flowing through it. A silicon diode has a voltage of about 600 millivolts when you pass enough current through it. The reason why this works can be explained by using the IV curve of a diode. This plot shows you what voltage you should expect across the diode when you pass a specific current through it and vice versa. As you can see, the curve is rather exponential. This means that after a certain point, increasing current through the device will have little impact on what voltage it produces. This is advantageous since we can simply attach a resistor to the diode from the supply rail. Since the exact current doesn't matter too much, the supply voltage can change quite a bit and the reference voltage will only change minimally. You can even stack two diodes on top of each other if you really want to add a bit more voltage to the reference. This type of reference is good enough for a lot of semi-precise applications, and I use it quite a bit myself. It is, however, still not the greatest voltage reference. Its accuracy depends on whatever the forward voltage of your particular diode happens to be. For silicon, while it is consistent within the range, it is imperfect and it can vary a bit, perhaps by an unacceptable amount. And despite it being somewhat resistant to power rail changes like I mentioned, it still isn't completely perfect, and that variation may be unacceptable for your circuit. And, of course, you are limited to the forward voltage of silicon, meaning that your voltage reference is going to be in increments of about 0.6 volts. There is, however, a different type of diode that you can use as a voltage reference, a Zener diode. A Zener diode is special because it has a very specific reverse breakdown voltage. This means that we can reverse bias a Zener diode using a similar setup to before and get our reference voltage. Unlike the silicon diode, a Zener diode has several different Zener voltages, which makes getting a suitable voltage much easier. It also has better line regulation than a plain silicon diode. There are a couple of disadvantages with Zeners though. First, a Zener is a pretty noisy voltage source, which may be an issue for specific applications. As a side note, there is actually a specific formation of Zener that doesn't have nearly as much of a problem with noise, which is called a buried Zener. But I'll talk about that later in the video since I'd say buried Zeners are quite a bit higher up in the food chain of voltage references. Anyway, second, the Zener works better with higher voltages, 
A Zener simply isn't suited to work as well with lower output voltages. Well, with that, I'd say that the three voltage references that I've just shown you form the three basic low performance voltage references that you'll see around in circuits. That isn't to say that they aren't useful, since I've used each of these in projects on this channel. You just have to determine whether these voltage references have good enough performance for the circuit you plan to use them in. GLC PCB is the sponsor of today's video. GLC PCB is a great place for when you get parts manufactured for your projects. I mainly use them for their PCB manufacturing capabilities, but they also offer 3D printing, CNC machining, and mechatronic parts. Ordering from GLC PCB is as simple as dropping your Gerber files onto their website and instantly receiving a quote. You are able to customize your order as necessary to get exactly what your project needs. I made my PCB this nice pretty blue color, and I also ordered a stencil for easier soldering. GLC PCB is a great option since they quickly manufacture your PCBs at an affordable rate. When I ordered my boards, they came without defect and they were in excellent condition. If you order from GLC PCB, make sure to take advantage of their 6 layer PCB special. You can get $30 off a 6 layer PCB, which means a 6 layer PCB starts at just $5. Click the link in the description to learn more. Anyway, moving forward, we are going to be more and more concerned with precision. Therefore, I'm going to introduce a new device consideration to you, and that's drift. More specifically, temperature drift. A basic silicon diode will actually drift roughly negative 2 millivolts per degree Celsius on its own. This drift may be unacceptable, and it is for many applications. Luckily, there is a way that we can mitigate this. This leads me to present to you perhaps the most famous voltage reference that you will hear of, and also the main focus of this video, the band gap voltage reference. This device revolves around a bipolar transistor, and it's an exercise in mathematics. As you might know, if you connect the base to the collector in a BJT, you simply end up with a diode, but we still have that annoying temperature dependence. I think now might be a good time to show you the equation for a bipolar transistor. If we take a look, we will find two different temperature dependent terms, saturation current and temperature. Temperature is obvious, since it's just the proportional temperature of the device. Saturation current is a bit more difficult to deal with and the term that we are going to try to eliminate. Imagine that we have access to two identical BJTs and we are able to compare them. Let's create a theoretical circuit where we take those two BJTs and drive them each with a slightly different base voltage. We can measure the difference in this base voltage with our voltmeter. We also know the exact collector current that is flowing with some ammeters. Now, if we do some math, we can use the original equation to come up with this one. Basically, the difference in base voltage between the two devices depends on the temperature and the difference in collector current. You should notice that the difficult saturation current parameter has been cancelled out, which leaves only the proportional temperature term, which is much easier to deal with. Our job now is to basically create a physically realizable circuit that can keep the currents between the two transistors at a constant ratio. In my circuit, I aim for collector current 1 to be 10 times larger than collector current 2. In integrated devices, it's common for the designers to increase the emitter area of one of the transistors to create this ratio. However, I'm going to be trying to make this on the PCB, and I don't really have a functional method to create integrated devices yet. So I was able to find an alternative method. Basically, instead of increasing the emitter size, we can keep the emitter size the same, but instead alter the collector current directly. I did this by placing two differently valued collector resistors. These resistors function as simple ammeters, since they will drop a voltage based on their current. You know, it's just Ohm's law. Basically, by sizing one of the resistors as 10 times larger than the other, we can get a 10 times smaller current while reading the same voltage across it. To ensure that the currents maintain the same ratio, we are going to place an op amp to measure their difference. Basically, if the currents really have a 10 times difference in magnitude, then the voltage difference should be zero. Otherwise, the op amp will do some action to correct that. To allow the op amp to correct the difference, we need to find some sort of way to connect it back to the bases of the transistors. We also need to ensure that the two transistors still have a small base emitter voltage difference despite being driven from the same input voltage. Luckily, this can easily be done by adding a resistor on the emitter of the device that will have a smaller base emitter voltage. This allows the difference in the base emitter voltage to be dropped while giving the transistors the same input voltage from the same input source. Interestingly, the value of this resistor sets the current through the collectors of both transistors, since the current through the emitter is roughly equal to the current through the collector.
you can estimate this current by first estimating the difference in the voltage of the bases. The collector resistors set the ratio, so we just need to insert an average temperature value of perhaps 20 Celsius, or 293 Kelvin. If you aren't aware, K is the Boltzmann constant, and Q is the charge of a single electron. If you solve this, it comes out to be about 25 millivolts. That equates to a voltage drop across the resistor of about 58 millivolts. Anyway, we are almost done. We will add one more resistor at the bottom. This resistor serves in canceling out some more temperature dependency. Basically, the final output voltage can be calculated by adding the voltage drop across R4 and the base emitter voltage of transistor 2. Transistor 2's base emitter voltage still has that negative 2 millivolt per degree Celsius problem that we've talked about in the beginning. However, we can now combine it with the voltage across R4. The voltage across R4 is a function of the two collector currents, which we just talked about being related to the proportional base emitter voltage difference. Basically, this current increases with increasing temperature, which is the opposite sign of transistor 2. I did a bit of math and determined that to get a roughly plus 2 millivolt change in voltage across R4, it should be sized the same as R3. And that's the essence of the design. The negative and positive temperature coefficients are added together to get as close to a net zero as possible. Of course, it isn't actually zero, but it's pretty close. The simulation estimates that we should get about 47 microvolts per degree Celsius of drift. Let me take some time to transform this into an actually usable real life circuit. First, we need the two transistors to be matched. Luckily, it's actually pretty easy to just buy devices that have two managed transistors on them, so that won't be a problem. Second, the op-amp that I will use is a Precision OPA330. This should hopefully eliminate the op-amp from contributing much drift to the performance of the circuit. Finally, we need to design a little bit more on the circuit. During the design explanation, I mentioned that the op-amp is driving two transistors such that the current sensing resistors drop the same voltage. Well, there are actually two different states where the op-amp can be satisfied. The first is the desired behavior that we talked about. The second is when the currents are both zero. So, to avoid the zero state, I added a small differential pair to act as a startup circuit. Basically, it checks to see if the output voltage is beyond a certain threshold. If it isn't, then it forces the resistor to draw a current until the op-amp flips over into the other state. I think it's cool to point out that we used another voltage reference here, albeit a simple diode one. This voltage reference is suitable since it doesn't need to be precise. It's simply large enough to ensure that the output isn't zero. Finally, I added two resistors on the output of the op-amp to give us a two times gain. I also added a few capacitors around to reduce any noise that we may encounter. Either way, the schematic is complete, and this is when I went and created the PCB layout and sent the board off to JLC PCB. Anyway, after soldering the PCB together, I created a simple test bench to ensure that it was working. I gave the board an input of 5 volts and hooked the output up to my 7.5 digit multimeter. I was impressed by the room temperature results. The initial voltage turned out to be about 2.317 volts, and it didn't drift much after leaving it for a few hours. Current draw was also good, sitting at 134 microamps. Already, this device is impressing me with its performance, but we need to check its temperature performance. That was the whole reason behind building the circuit in the first place anyways. At first, I thought I could get away with simply using my hot air gun, but I found that the minimum temperature was 100 Celsius. It also created problems with temperature stability since it was constantly moving air. So I instead came up with a better solution. I have this aluminum enclosure that has been sitting around for several years, and I finally have been putting it to use as the housing of our new temperature chamber. Now, to change the temperature of the chamber, I got this thermoelectric cooler. It will basically allow us to set a temperature without any moving parts by simply changing the input power. However, the cooler itself will need a heat sink. This is because the cooler creates a temperature differential between its two sides. So to make the chamber cold, the other side will get hot. So really, the heat sink is there to make sure the other side always stays at room temperature. I drilled a couple of holes in this chamber to mount the heat sink. I then applied thermal paste to both sides of the cooler to thermally blind everything together. After this, I attached my power supply to the module and adjusted the input voltage to determine the chamber's temperature. Interestingly, when I did the cold temperatures, I actually got a bit of frost forming on the bottom of the chamber. Anyway, here is the data that I was able to plot from the experiment. The voltage reference drifts down very consistently starting from about 0 Celsius down to about 60 Celsius.
Afterwards, the drift reverses direction and starts going back up until we reach the final test temperature of 90 Celsius. The slope on the way down was about 1.3 millivolts per degree Celsius. So basically, not the greatest and not really that close to what we simulated, but it's still much better than the original 2 millivolts per degree Celsius with the plane diode that we looked at initially. I'm still happy with it considering that it was made on the PCB. Integrated references that you can purchase will have a much better performance, especially since the whole device shares the same silicon as well as it contains additional calibration circuitry in the form of trims to help correct for temperature variation. The band gap voltage reference is so widely used because it has excellent accuracy and drift for a minimal component count. If you were after even more accuracy though, then there is so much more that can be done. This is where the buried Zener voltage reference that I mentioned a while ago comes back into view. Normal Zeners have the problem of being very noisy, but buried Zeners don't have that problem. Furthermore, they have some of the best long-term drift available. The 3458A multimeter uses the LTZ1000, which is basically the holy grail for the precision DC electronics community. This specific voltage reference has the aforementioned advantages of the buried Zener that I just mentioned. It also eliminates temperature dependence by ovenizing itself. Basically, it sets its own temperature to avoid temperature drift. This is a Ref80 evaluation board. This is a recently released device from Texas Instruments that seems to be a comparable device to the long-standing LTZ1000. It utilizes a buried zener like the LTZ1000 does. It is also similarly self-ovenized. This should prevent any temperature-based drift since, well, it's always the same temperature. The evaluation board also includes this little cover to prevent any airflow from changing the device's temperature. I also find it really interesting how the board was designed to directly connect to a multimeter with these banana posts. Anyway, this device is leagues better than my DIY band gap design. Even from just watching the multimeter's output, we can see how stable it is. I mean, the last digit barely ever changes. Anyway, I left it out overnight to compare the results. About 15 hours later, the reference had drifted by about 120 microvolts, and the voltage was barely even changing anymore. If you look in voltage reference data sheets for long-term drift, you will see that the most drift occurs at the very beginning of the device's lifespan. This means that the drift we saw overnight is likely the most drift we will ever see on this reference. Anyway, I thought that we should at least mention the best voltage reference that there is, and that is a Josephson Junction voltage reference. It uses superconductors and physical constants to basically create a perfect output voltage. Obviously, this isn't something that I currently have access to, but it's certainly fun to think about. Well, there it is. Voltage references in order from worst to best. For most people watching, everything from the voltage divider up to the band gap are circuits that you will use. Anything better than that quickly approaches niche territory. If you've enjoyed watching this video, please consider subscribing so that you can see my future videos. Also, visit my Buy Me A Coffee page, because with your support, I can keep making these videos. I'd like to thank Mr. Deb Null, Cognizant Mark, Alex Nigren, and Waffles the Doc for being channel members. You all have made this video possible. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.